Hello everyone, uh, today I'm going to be talking about Elixir's Vitamins Bomb. Um, the reason why I'm making this video is I took quantum information with Dr. Aronson a couple of months back and he presented this concept in class and while I was studying for the exam I was trying to find some resources online and couldn't find much that at least that I liked so hopefully it, this might help you in the future if you're taking this class or you just want to learn about the experiment. Um, there are two slightly different interpretations. There is the physics interpretation and there is the computer science interpretation. The one that I was presented in class was the computer science. I'm going to be making a video in the future about the computer science interpretation. So check that out too if you want. So the Elitzer Weidman's bomb experiment is a very, I think it's a very important experiment if you're trying to understand quantum mechanics and its implications. I think it really brings into light Feynman's quote, uh, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you it's because you don't understand quantum mechanics. In order to understand this video, you don't need much uh, physics, you don't need much advanced physics knowledge. All you need to understand is the double slit experiment, which is one of the most famous experiments, if not the most famous experiments in quantum mechanics. If you're not familiar with this experiment, I'll go ahead and leave a link in the description below where you can uh, where you can watch one of my favorite videos on it. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. For this experimental setup, we only need four components. We need mirrors, we need 50-50 beam splitters, and two detectors. Um, mirrors are pretty straightforward. If a photon comes in, it's going to be reflected at the same angle it came in with. So um, if you're not familiar with beam splitters, I'm going to go ahead and give a simple explanation. Let's imagine this arrow that I have on my screen is a photon, and it's going to hit the beam splitter. There's two possibilities. It can either go through the beam splitter, or it can hit it and get reflected off of it. Now, as we know in quantum mechanics, superpositions exist, which means that if we send one single photon here and there's a 50% chance the photon will go through or get reflected off the beam splitter, in reality, it's gonna get in a superposition between these two states. So at the same time, it's gonna have, it's gonna be reflected and transmitted through the beam splitter. Detectors are pretty straightforward. Uh, if a photon hits them, then they'll just click which just means that they'll send out a signal saying, hey, a, a photon hit me. So you can, for example, have it set up to a computer. All right, so now let's go ahead and build our experiment. The first thing we're gonna need is a source of photons. So let's say we just have a laser that shoots single photons at a time. All right, so this is our laser. So the first thing we're gonna add to the experiment is a beam splitter. And let's go ahead and put that in the path of the laser. So now, just as I mentioned before, after the photon hits the beam splitter, it's going to enter a superposition between going upwards and going to the right. So we would end up with something like this. So now let's just go ahead and add two mirrors to these paths. As such, these mirrors are angled at 45 degrees, which means they will reflect our photons 90 degrees. So if we follow the paths of our photons after they're being reflected, they, they should meet up again on this right corner. So this is what our experiment looks up to this point. We have a single photon source over here, which is gonna shoot photons into this beam splitter. Let's forget about superposition for a second. Let's say that our photon gets reflected off the beam splitter. That means that the photon will travel upwards and then hit the mirror and get reflected off to this side. And on this, on the other case, the photon will go through the beam splitter, get reflected off this mirror and go upwards. So we have technically two paths that the photon can take. Let's call one of them V and the other one W. If you don't know what these tags mean, these little, uh, they're called kets. Don't worry about it too much. Just think of it as a label to the path. Now let's go ahead and add a second beam splitter at the top here. And finally, let's place two detectors after this beam splitter. Now, 
The specific position of the detectors is a bit tricky. And to understand why, let's go ahead and take a look at the double slit experiment. As we know, after the photon goes through both slits at the same time, it experiences interference with itself, which means that it's going to show an interference pattern at the screen where we detect it. It's going to be brightest at the middle, and then it will die off as we move out. If we remember, in this interference pattern graph that we see on the screen, there are some spots where the photon destructively interferes with itself. All these troughs here, there's 0% probability of the photon landing there. But this shape of the graph can be changed. If we change the distance between the two slits or the distance between the two screens, for example, we could move the 0% probability spot upwards or downwards. Now let's go back to our experiment. So using the same concept from the double slit experiment, we're going to place the detectors in such a way such that there is constructive interference at the detector number one and there's destructive interference at detector number two. If we went back to our double slit analogy, this means that at detector one there is a peak and at detector two there is a trough. Thus, there is no way a photon lands on detector 2 because of the destructive interference of waves from path V and W. Now, let's go back to our double slit one more time. Let's say, for example, we block one of the slits. Okay, now that we've blocked one slit, the interference pattern is going to be gone. I'm going to put it on the side here so we can reference back to it. but as it is intuitive, we would expect to find the photon closest to the slit. So we would see some sort of Gaussian shape as such. Of course, again, imagine my drawings are more of the shapes that I'm describing. Now, let's look back and put the interference pattern we had above it. Now, let me slowly put this interference pattern on top of our new wave. And let me change the color. Now, after blocking one of the slits, we're actually able to reach some spots that would have not been hit at all by any photons before with both slits. So let's go ahead and bring that concept back into our experiment and say, okay, what happens if I put an obstacle in V's path? Let's say I put a wall on path V. This will prevent the photon from traveling through this path and therefore it will not be able to interfere with itself at the beam splitter. What this means is that this trough that we had on D2 is going to be gone and the peak that we had at D1 from constructive interference is gone too. Now we only have this one photon reaching the beam splitter which as this is a 50-50 beam splitter, there's a 50% chance it'll hit D1 and there's a 50% chance it'll hit D2. Now, what if I told you that's a whole experiment? Wouldn't you feel like that's a bit disappointing? Why would I even be making a video of this? Nothing happened at all. The implications of this experiment are not very apparent at first. And I think this is why Weitman and Elitzer decided to take the example of bombs into it. So let's say you bought a hundred bombs and these are very specific bombs. As you can see here, they're inside a box and the only way to trigger them is through this green line here. In this case, the green line is a photon sensor. If a single photon hits that sensor, the bomb will explode. As we said, you have a hundred of these bombs and let's say you get a call from the manufacturer and they tell you, hey, we screwed up and half of the bombs we gave you are actually fake. They don't have the photon sensor, so there's no way for you to explode them. Now, you have all these bombs, and the only way for you to know if a bomb is real or not is to shine light on it and see if it explodes. And then, if you knew if it explodes, you know it's real, but your bomb is gone. You can't use it anymore. But what if I told you there is another way to see if this bomb is real without exploding it? That's where the experiment, the Elitzer-Weitman experiment comes into place. 
So let's go ahead and take this bomb and put it in our experiment. Now let's go ahead and place our bomb on path B. Now let's say this is one of our fake bombs, so the photon sensor is missing. That means that any photons can go through our bomb without any problem. Since our bomb is fake and the photon sensor is missing, that means that a photon can go right through it, which means path V is open. Thus, our interference will happen at the beam splitter, and again, we will only detect photons in detector D1. Let's say our bomb is real. If our bomb is real, it means we have an obstacle on path V again. Thus, the interference pattern is gone. Here's where the main point of the experiment comes in. Let's say we have a bomb, and we don't know if it's real or if it's fake. And we place it on our experiment. There's only three possible outcomes of our experiment. First outcome is detector D1 clicks. What do we get from this outcome? We get no information. Detector D1 clicks if there is an obstacle on path V and if there's not an obstacle on path V. The second outcome is that no detector clicks. For this to happen, the photon must scatter off something. And the only thing that could scatter our photon in this experiment would be the obstacle, which in this case, it's the bomb, which means it hit the bomb. In this scenario, basically our bomb explodes. Now the third scenario is where the photon actually goes through path W and hits the beam splitter and it's reflected off of it into detector D2. The only way a photon hits detector D2 is if the path V is interrupted, which means we know there is a real bomb on path V. So you basically were able to tell if a bomb was real or not without detonating it. So you might think, okay, but why do we care so much about this? You need to think about the actual physical implications of this. The only way we are able to interact with other objects is to either have a particle travel from them to us or some sort of wave. For example, the only way we're able to see stuff around us is because there are photons bouncing off those things and hitting our eyes. There is a photon traveling from the object you're seeing towards your eye. How do we hear things? We're able to hear things because sound waves travel from the things we're hearing into our ears. How are we able to interact with this bomb without touching it at all? Any sensor that has ever been engineered has some sort of particle or wave that travels from the thing that it's sensing towards the sensor. In this case, we did not interact with our bomb at all, yet we were able to gain information from it. This sort of thing is what bothered Einstein and Schrodinger so much about quantum mechanics. And if you want to think about explanations for this, we really don't know. That's why there's so much debate behind the interpretations of quantum mechanics. If you want to think about it, for example, in the many worlds interpretation from Everett, in this world, if we were able to find information from the bomb without touching it, there has to be another world where the bomb actually exploded. So if we were actually able to build this experiment and you successfully measured this bomb without touching it, you believe in this interpretation, you can guarantee yourself you died on a different world. Um, well, yeah, I think that was my brief explanation of this experiment. Let me know if anything didn't make sense. If you have any questions, um, I'll go ahead and leave a link on the description for the original paper from Elitzer and Weidman and also a short essay I wrote about this experiment as well that does not need very advanced physics knowledge. There's a few bra and cats there from Dirac notation. If you don't know that, you can Google it. It's not too complicated either. Um, but yeah, let me know what you think and thanks for watching.